I am life. I am home to millions. And I sustain millions more. My abundance brings prosperity, while my scarcity can be deadly. I cover much of the earth, and my influence extends far beyond. I have been around for longer than you can imagine. But my world is threatened. People need to take notice and do more to secure my future because I am worth protecting. Your health relies on my health. Your life relies on mine. I am plants. I am life. everyone and welcome to Channel World Seed. My name is Francine Sayok with the International Seed Federation and we are coming to you from our studio here in Switzerland. Today we are so fortunate to be able to gather an extraordinary set of speakers on a topic that is important not just to us in the seed sector but to most everyone as you will find out. I'm talking about plant health. Last year the United Nations declared 2020 as the International Year of Plant Health. And as you know, last year has been unlike any other year. But this year, the focus on plant health continues. I'd like to start the discussion with our first speaker, Mr. Ralph Lopian, who chairs the International Steering Committee for the International Year of Plant Health. Ralph, please tell us how the celebration went last year and what we can expect in 2021. Thank you, Francine, and it's good to be here. Um, as you may know, the uh, United Nations General Assembly proclaimed the International Year of Plant Health in 2019. Uh, it was an effort uh, to promote uh, the awareness of the general public uh, and uh, international trade about the dangers, pests and diseases of plants pose to our uh, plants, to our food crops, to ecosystems. And uh, while the Year of Plant Health has been aiming to protect plants uh, uh, from all pests, the focus has been very much on the prevention of the international spread of pests and diseases. Somehow you can compare it to a certain degree with COVID-19, a disease, a human disease, which spread around the world. And as human disease can spread around the world, so can plant pests. And we have seen that for many years. Uh, the International Year of Plant Health uh, started very well. Uh, we had an opening ceremony in December last uh, 2019, and we had a number of high-level events already in the first uh, quarter of 2019, but then COVID-19 struck and all the activities all around the world have been delayed or cancelled, uh, at least the physical events. Uh, due to that, uh, the international year was then prolonged by the uh, Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations until mid-2021, because uh, an international year of plant health where no activities concerning plant health take place is somehow a loss uh, of time and efforts. Now, for this prolongation, until the 1st of July 2021, we have planned now a number of activities and major events. And uh, we will have a, a, a really important major international study on climate change impacts on plant health. Uh, a number of international renowned scientists have uh, worked together to develop uh, effects the dispersion uh, and the importance of plant pests and diseases around the world. And this study is to be uh, presented by the authors in a high-level event on the 1st of June uh, 2021 in Rome. Thank you, Ralph. Indeed, we need to continue raising awareness about protecting plants, not only this year, but also beyond that. And that is precisely why I'm very pleased to welcome our next guest. He is the UK's leading garden writer and broadcaster, who has been making television programs for over 20 years on a variety of topics, 
including travel, craft, outdoor living, and most of all, gardening. He has been lead presenter of the BBC's Gardener's World since 2003, and he has visited some of the world's most celebrated gardens and made acclaimed primetime series like Around the World in 80 Gardens, Monty Don's Italian Gardens, and three series of Big Dreams, Small Spaces. Today, we will hear about how his passion for plants began and how he sees his role as plant health advocate. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to introduce Mr. Monty Don. Hello, uh, it is a great privilege to talk to you all. Um, and I feel a bit of an imposter here, really, because fundamentally, I'm a gardener. I'm also a farmer in a small way, but uh, I've spent most of my working life either writing about gardening, broadcasting gardening, and all my spare time actually gardening. Uh, it is my passion. And one of the things that I always proudly declare is I'm not a trained horticulturalist. I'm a gardener. I'm an amateur gardener. And I do it because I love it and it's my obsession. And I talk through my television programs and my magazines and newspapers and books to other amateur gardeners. And certainly in the UK, there are tens of millions of extremely keen, extremely knowledgeable gardeners. And they deal with plants and plant health, certainly on a daily basis, and millions of them on an hourly basis. It is, uh, if anything, it is one of the defining passions of the British people. And I've traveled all over the world uh, and will continue to do so. Uh, and certainly there are wonderful gardens all over the world and superb gardeners, but I don't think there's another nation that shares the same extent of fervor for gardening as an activity. It's more than a hobby, it's part of our lives. And one of the things that I have been involved in ever since I was in my 20s, which was many, many years ago now, is organic gardening. I'm an organic gardener. I was president of the Soil Association, the British Organic Movement, for many years. Um, and obviously, that means in dealing with the health of plants and of gardens and of the ecosystem in a holistic way. We regard, and I regard very much, as a healthy plant as something that cannot possibly exist independently of a healthy garden, of a healthy ecosystem, of a healthy planet. And I would even go so far as to say a healthy society. In other words, there is a moral element to it. And whilst that is uncomfortable ground for many people to tread, it is one that I know the growing generation, my children's generation, who are in their 30s, are completely involved in. And one of the reasons why I wanted to be involved in the year of plant health was not really for me or for my peers or anybody of my age group. I speak to millions of those all the time. I know what they think. I like them, I trust them, and I hope they like and trust me. I'm much more interested in the new generation, the people who are coming through in their 20s and their 30s and even in their 40s. And these are the people that we are passing the world on to. These are our inheritors. And plant health, which can't be separated from climate change, from the depredation of this planet that my generation and my parents' generation and grandparents have uh, committed, have to be included. And in practical terms, as a gardener, uh, I regard plant health as making sure that every plant is as well adapted to the situation that it is in as possible. In other words, the least that I have to do as a gardener, the healthier the plant is. The more intention that is involved, the more of a problem that it indicates. And I regard failure as a plant that needs constant feeding, let alone might need fungicides or herbicides or whatever it might be. Successful plant growth is one where I can give the plant the best possible circumstances in which to adapt. Now, that may not be the biggest plant. It may not be the most productive. And as a farmer, I'm fully aware of the implications of that. 
and that we have to produce healthy food in sufficient quantities to feed the world. And this is not an easy problem to square. Although uh, I am persuaded that the health of farming and food production does not lie in a few large corporations imposing monoculture and with a whole series of, of food chains that are providing poor food to the world, but an interconnected vast web of smaller growers, very often family-based, who have generations of knowledge to care for their land, to care for their soil, who know their environment and are producing food of the highest quality, albeit on a smaller scale. And it's very interesting to, to be involved in seeds because seeds obviously with gardeners, the issue that we have is that a broad range of seeds, a wide variety that are part of our heritage. And in the 19th century in Britain, there were hundreds of different varieties of peas, for example. Uh, you could grow seeds that were only related to a local area, but very well adapted to the climate and the soil of that area. This has become impossible. And we have seed swaps, whereby we exchange seeds and we keep diversity going. So I'm all in favor of as much diversity as possible, as little human intervention as possible, which is not to say that I don't believe in plant breeding, or even, very controversially, but I've been often be criticized for it, in the use of genetically modified organisms. But this is something that needs very, very careful scrutiny and overseeing. So these are big, very complicated, difficult subjects, which is why I want to be involved. But above all, I think that a young generation coming through that cares for the planet, that cares for their gardens and the food that they eat, that can come back to caring for plants and the soil and making sure that the future is sustainable and viable and integrated. And that's why I'm here. Thank you, Monty. Your passion is truly infectious, to use a, a plant health term, um, and I hope it continues to spread. Um, our next speaker is another well-loved television personality, garden designer, and author of no less than 13 books on garden design. He has designed gardens throughout Ireland and the UK, mainland Europe, Africa, and China. In 2011, he won the gold medal in the prestigious Chelsea Flower Show of the Royal Horticultural Society. As a broadcaster, he presented gardening series in the UK, including Homefront, Planet Patio, Art of the Garden, and many others. Today, we're going to hear about his work and his advocacy and what being a plant health advocate means to him. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mr. Dermot Gavin. Hello, everybody. I'm delighted and indeed honored to be here. So I live on the island next door to Monty. I live in Ireland and on the east coast of Ireland, just below Dublin in a county called the Garden of Ireland. It's uh, County Wicklow. That's a very beautiful, verdant place. Uh, the wonderful thing about living in these islands really is that we really appreciate four distinct seasons. So we have spring, summer, autumn and winter and they slowly melt into each other. So at this moment in time, we're coming out of what has been a cold, slightly, what well, very disturbing um, winter. And the next season is the one that's absolutely full of hope. It's full of longer days, uh, longer evenings. It's full of plants pushing up out of the soil. It's full of new buds. It's full of flowers forming on um, kind of old stems. And as a gardener, you're somebody who's really aware of your environment. I'm a suburban boy. I was brought up in one of those myriads of roads that surround cities. Dublin isn't a particularly big city, but our suburb was the same as anybody else's in the world. As an eight-year-old, I was in the Cub Scouts, and this was an organization through which you could achieve badges. And it was one badge I wanted to get, which was gardening. So I was sent down to Mrs. Flynn, who lived at the end of the road, and she was of country stock, and she knew how to grow seeds. 
So she told me the fastest seeds were mustard and cress. And she laid them out on a tray on some damp tea towel, uh, uh, just a damp piece of cloth, put them in the dark. And within two days, they had sprouted and grown a small stalk and two primary leaves. And from that moment on, I was utterly fascinated. Very near where I lived, there was a park. It used to be the house that it was the ancestral home of George Ber the B George Bernard Shaw family. And it had a woodland, and I would get lost in the magic of that woodland with a big, a huge tree canopy, bamboos grown by water, and ferns going everywhere. And I thought this was the most incredible wonderland. And because of all of these things, and because I was kind of socially inept and a bit of a dreamer, I became a gardener. We're all amateur gardeners. I did go to college, I did learn about all the chemicals that could be poured on soil. And even way back then, I felt that innately this had to be wrong. I would be in complete agreement with Monty that the less intervention in our gardens, the better. Gardens are kind of complicated things in these islands because they're not just go about growing about plants. They're about style, they're about social achievement, they're about money, they're about power, and they're about, I think, also aristocracy. The exciting thing is, in my experience, more people have gardens than ever before or have access to gardens. And what has happened as a result of the various lockdowns that we've been through is that it's one of those things that people turned to and they were scared about getting about a potential lack of loo roll or toilet paper. And the next thing they were scared about was that they couldn't get compost or seeds. And there was a huge run on these uh, materials early last year. And as Mon Monty talks about his excitement in the new gardener, people who are in their 20s, 30s and 40s, that's the person who has really begun to examine what life is all about. And in some cases, find answers in the soil. It's the most magical thing to see a seed grow. It's the most amazing thing to realize that most of life on earth really is around because of a skim of six or eight inches of topsoil. And in that topsoil, if you look into it, it's bursting in life. But I'm also aware, being a gardener, of the inequality in, in life and the inequality in gardening and what gardening means to different people. In 2006, I went to on a project to Kenya and I met this woman and I often think back to her. We were introduced to her as a farmer. Um, uh, her name was Harris Nandana and her husband had to leave the family to go and work in the city to earn money for the family. and. The issue that she had was the lack of rain. Because when the rains came, they came torrentially down and she wanted to grow plants, but she couldn't save that water. And she did the most innovative things, just building bricks from mud, baking them in the sun, plastering them with soil and building water tanks. One water tank, two, three, four, and then five and channels between all these water tanks so that when one was, when the rains came, the first tank would fill, then the second, then the third. And then she got seeds and cuttings. And she gave a future to her family and she gave jobs to other people in the village. And she became a prosperous farmer uh, because she had some intelligence, some help from NGOs, but perseverance, and she knew about the power of nature and seeds and cuttings. And often when I'm doing gardens for wealthy people in the West, I think back to her and think about climate change, about what we in the West maybe have taken through our industrial revolutions and our um, constant uh, needs to acquire more and more. And maybe this past year has slowed things down and maybe we're beginning to see the value and some of that value or a lot of that value, I think, really lies in the soil. 
And it's for those reasons that I'm very pleased and proud to take part in the, um, th this initiative about plant health and soil health. Thank you, Dermot. That's very inspiring to hear. And indeed, in these uncertain times, uh, gardening and farming in general is, is a great act of hope. And now I want to shift to a more specific topic, seeds, uh, that our speakers have mentioned it already. Um, well, seed is said to be the starting point of the food system and without healthy seeds, there will be no healthy plants. Um, and at this point, I would like to ask the Secretary General of the International Seed Federation, Mr. Michael Keller, to tell us how ISF and the seed sector are participating in the International Year of Plant Health and how do we connect plant health to the seed sector's goals? Yeah, thanks so much, um, Francine. Thanks so much for inviting me to take a talk about this so important topic for the International Seed Federation. Allow me, we are speaking about the International Year of Plant Health, but it's also about the people. And allow me, Ralph is on the call with us today. And I think Ralph is the chairman, but also is the promoter during years that we get this International Year of Plant Health and that we have a dynamic year of international plant health is important to recognize his role because it's also about the people. And therefore also thank you from the private seed sector side to, to Ralph and all what he has done the recent years. Yes, the International Seed Federation is engaged since years now in the preparation and in rolling out the International Year of Plant Health. Why? Because it's about healthy plants. But healthy plants starts with healthy seeds. And let's go further. Healthy plants are essential for healthy food. That means it's about us. It's about a healthy life cycle. And the speakers before yet mentioned this. We need to remind us all is linked. We have a joint responsibility. And let me point out, Ralph mentioned the pandemic. Yes, it's difficult times. But we should not forget, I think we have all private sector, civil society and the governments, we have a, an objective in 2030. It's to achieve the sustainable development goals. And the International Year of Plant Health is participating also in the achievement of this. Because when you take a couple of these sustainable development goals, like fight against hunger, fight against poverty, engagement on climate action, coordination between the different bodies. We are in. I think all these topics are part of the internality of plant health. I mentioned climate change and, and Ralph mentioned there will be a study going out. Yeah, we need to mention it because at the same time we have also an increase of pests and diseases worldwide. And as for the pandemic we have currently with COVID-19, there are no borders. They are moving, they are spreading around. And I think this is our joint responsibility to take it up, each at its, pre its proper position at the end in this whole um, discussion. When I'm coming now to the private seed sector, yes, we are representing more than 8,000 companies around the world, family business, cooperatives, small, medium, multinational companies, and all are engaged in one thing, provide choice, and Monte Dunn, you mentioned it also, it's an important point. Choice to farmers, to gardeners of healthy seed. And we are speaking about healthy seed because that's also our responsibility. We need to ensure that our seeds are healthy. How we are doing this? First of all, yes, we are breeding. We have breeding tools. We are breeding new varieties to address pests and diseases. But secondly, also, we have testing, we have protocols. This is our responsibility. We have pest lists. Also to be clear that seed is not a pathway for any pests or disease. And together the governments would like to close their borders against pests and diseases. We as the private sector, we would like to limit and are engaged to stop any spread of diseases or pests through um, seeds. Therefore, you see, together we have this joint responsibility um, to move forward. And therefore, International Year of Plant Health, it's an important moment. We didn't stop before and we will not stop afterwards in our engagement together for healthy seed, healthy plants 
and also healthy food. Because also let not forget this year is the United Nations Food Systems Summit. There is no one-size-fits-all food system. There is no one-size-fits-all seed. Seeds need to be locally adapted. And therefore, we will continue in this direction together. Thank you, Michael. It all starts with seed. Um, in this part of the talk, we've asked our guests to prepare some questions that they've been meaning to ask each other. Um, and let's keep this very interesting conversation going. Uh, I'd like to start with Monty, and then we'll go around the table. Go ahead, Monty, please ask a question to anyone. Well, I suppose the, the overriding question that I get is, how do you provide healthy seed, which we all agree is very important and is, is the essence, and, and historically there's been huge wastage of, of seed because it's not been healthy or not germinated or whatever, uh, without corporate ownership and domination of seed supply, how does one square the problem of you know, this, this inverted commas, feeding the world, which is, is open to great debate, um, providing healthy seed, providing diversity, providing access to seeds within the financial uh, scope of small producers as well as large ones, without the tyranny that has been completely unacceptably present of large in international global companies holding small producers to ransom. In any case, you know, all our breeding programs, all what we are doing is to provide a choice to a farmer. That means it needs to be a choice for a farmer and the seed needs to be locally adapted. In any case, that means it is not up to the private seed sector to say, hey, you have to take this and this and this. I think that's the important one. That's also somehow our philosophy. And, and our breeding is therefore also adapted to help the farmers to address the diversity of issues they are facing on the ground. That means we mentioned pest diseases. We can mention also there is a need still, and I think we all agree, there is still a need also to increase yield because we know the figures. We do not need to repeat how many people we will be into in 2050 um, worldwide. There are also points about Inputs, that means we have perhaps also to think about more trout tolerance um, varieties. I think there's a whole range of things we also as a breeder try to support as best as possible the farmers um, around the world. And I think that's also where I'm always saying um, you need to see the diversity. We speak about the diversity of seed, but there's also diversity of um, within our membership. You know, when you are looking on all the crops we are working. That means it's from vegetables, it's to field crops, but it's also to forage and turf and ornamentals. And this also in a full diverse range of um, companies sitting around the world somehow. And I think therefore it's extremely important that um, from our perspective, the diversity is here, but the more important thing is really that we are also responding, supporting and contributing to the farmer's capacity to address um, the different issues he's facing and to achieve, and I think that's always what we are saying also, we have one vision as the seed sector, to provide and to make accessible quality seed, quality healthy seed, to address um, climate change, sustainable agriculture and food security. Thank you. Who would like to go next? I'd love to ask a question about the experience of the seed companies in the past year. We're coming into a new season and all the catalogs are out and people are buying in this part of the world their vegetable seeds and their flower seeds to grow for themselves. Has that is the evidence that that new gardener that may have come as a byproduct of the pandemic is still interested and uh, is looking to more, ha has started with maybe some simple plants and is looking to grow tomatoes or chilies or, or, or whatever in this second year. 
Uh, absolutely. I think, first of all, um, it's clear the pandemia um, pushed more people to be interested in nature, but also then more specifically in, in gardening. But I think we can say from the private seed sector, since, since years now, there's a clear reconnection, and Monty, then you mentioned reconnection of the younger people in, um, in gardening, in nature, um, but also there's a, an increase, and I think that's important also because we speak here about dialogue, in they're looking to understand also more about agriculture, about food production, where is food coming from? Um, and at the end, then the third level is then also they want even to be part of this by trying themselves to put themselves in somehow the, the uh, person who is, who is um, gardening. And, and let's be frank, I think in this virtual world, we are all, yes, lacking social contact. And what is somehow more, more exciting than to be out in its garden or in its field to touch the earth, to plant and to grow? Um, I think this is clearly something where you see, you, you see the link and the interest, the increased interest um, of, the, of the people. And I think this is clear. In, in these times, there's an increased um, interest. There is also, and I'm, I'm always saying, um, you know, when you're, you spoke about the seed catalogs, and there was a wonderful article recently in the Financial Times who spoke about the seed of contentment. I think that's perfectly describing seed from where it's coming, where it's going, where it's growing. And then you have seed catalogs where you see what can be out, coming out of a seed. This is really about somehow happiness, but also of, of contentment. That means we are in a, in a changing society. There's a paradigm change, it's sure. We see it, it's clear. Hobby gardening is an increasing part also for uh, the, the, the private seed sector um, out there. Perhaps one thing to mention here, because, and, and remember last year at the same time, a little bit later then, um, there were lockdowns. That means also garden shops were closed. That means lots of people in the northern hemisphere were faced also they couldn't supply themselves also to prepare somehow the season. I think, I hope that this year we can handle this to keep these dynamics, to bring the people back to nature, this relationship we lost, I think, in the, in the, in the past years, but fully agree there is dynamics, there is excitement, and, and again, it's about content. You've been uh, just, answering. Just Sorry, go can ahead. I make a point? Yeah, uh, I've been talking to seed companies and and the BBC researchers have been talking that that seed uptake this year is greater than ever. So the and, and in fact it's becoming hard to get seeds not because there's a particular shortage of supply. It's just it, uh, demand is exceeding supply. So the good news is that the impetus that began last spring with that surge of of sort of interaction with people's gardens as a result of lockdown is being carried through. So that's good news. It's, it's very good news. It, it makes me smile in a way because I remember maybe seven or eight years ago, the seed companies in the UK were trying to make growing trendy and trying to uh, yeah. give all sorts of kits and whatever added value and, and, and whatever and it takes a pandemic to make us realize yeah. uh, how much we need this mm. very well said now michael you've been answering most of the questions so now i'm giving you your turn to ask the question yeah and i'm very pleased to to uh, make a question to to ralph to understand is there still possibilities or are there still possibilities today to be part of this international year of plant health? Yes, we are yet in 2021. The year started in 2020. But perhaps also more important, um, perhaps to provide us some insights, will there be a, a key event who will closing somehow this international year of plant health? By knowing we will not stop here. We will continue um, also during the next years. Thank you very much, Michael, for this question. And uh, uh, I must say, I would be devastated if we would stop all activities on 1st of July with the ending of the International Year of Plant Health, because it would show that we have nothing really achieved. Uh, the International Year, as it was thought, was only a beginning. 
beginning to do something and to continue this is undertaking in the future. And so, uh, uh, and uh, to come back maybe to a point which Monty made in his first intervention, uh, uh, what we are trying to do very much is to uh, embed in the consciousness of people, of normal uh, uh, people in each and every country of this world, that the plant variability and our plants are a treasure. And uh, people do not realize that this treasure is under threat. When you look at Europe and you see that most of the stands of elms in Europe have disappeared, and not only Europe, also North America, because of an introduced uh, fungal disease. When you see that, for instance, in the United Kingdom, ashes may be becoming in the future a rarity because of ash dieback disease. When you see that, for instance, uh, uh, chestnuts, majest uh, majestic chestnut trees in Europe are disappearing at an alarming rate because of an introduced fungal disease. Uh, and when you see that uh, the entire Mediterranean bas basin is at threat because of an introduced uh, uh, bacteria of olive trees, which is threatening to change the entire economic and social structure of the Mediterranean uh, olive tree regions. Uh, uh, people don't recognize that, but we must see that and we must make that uh, to people, to make people aware of that, because that is what we are facing. We are facing that our environment, our plant environment is becoming poorer and poorer and poorer because we are losing one species uh, at an alarming rate. So we hope that uh, uh, after the 1st of July, there is still uh, things to do. And of course, we have done a lot of legacy work within the international year until now. Uh, uh, we have uh, worked uh, 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 to have the 12th of May as the International Day of Plant Health and the government of Zambia has proposed to the United Nations that the 12th of May will be celebrated as International Day of Plant Health. Uh, it will be most probably discussed at the United Nations General Assembly uh, in September to November this year and adopted. And if it is adopted, then we will have the first internet in 2022. And I can, I'm happy to announce that uh, uh, a couple of days ago, we had the International Steering Committee meeting and we decided that the first International Plant Health Conference, which was originally planned to be a, a flagship event for the international year, will be now moved to 2022 and to be part of the celebration of the first International Day of Plant Health. We are going to make a number of webinars now uh, during COVID-19 times uh, uh, in order to prepare for this, for this uh, uh, conference. Uh, webinars about risk analysis, webinars about diagnostics, uh, about uh, 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 surveillance and monitoring and emergency response systems. Uh, and uh, I can also tell you that we will have in about uh, uh, six weeks time, we will have the 15th meeting of the International Plant Protection Convention Commission on Phytosanitary Measures, which is the governing body. And there we have a very, very ambitious strategic framework for 2020 to 2030, uh, uh, which is trying to address a number of the most critical and important developments internationally, uh, climate change, research coordinations between countries and so on, because uh, unfortunately, plant health authorities around the world and researchers around the world are facing a situation where researchers, uh, where resources for research are cut down considerably uh, by governments worldwide. We will have uh, 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 important issues like climate change considerably. And I would like to repeat, it is the most important issue to make people aware that we can save our 
ecosystems from the introduction of alien invasive plant pests and diseases only if we are working and dealing with gardening and seeds responsibly. Thank you. Uh, I think that's a great note to end with. And at this point, I want to close the episode by thanking our speakers for joining us today. This has been such a tremendous opportunity for ISF to have you here. So I want to thank you for your time and your presence and your viewpoint um, today. To our followers, please stay tuned here on channel World Seed. And if you've got a topic you'd like us to do an episode on, just tell us in the comments. Thanks again, everybody. And please take care and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.